this will be a little bit of a different episode from the recent ones, and the work we're doing is pretty straightforward. The first thing we'll do is move the car. It's something that hasn't really been seen since the first episode. It cranks for a little longer than I'd like on a cold start, but it might just be a leaking fuel pressure regulator, or it might just be old. All things considered, it starts really well and does it every time. And in this shot, we can see that not only do the brake lights work, but the reverse lights work too. After doing all of that work in the garage the last few episodes, the car went back to sit outside. It definitely leaks in the rain, so for those days, we'll just cover it with a tarp. A car cover would be more ideal, but at the time, this is what we had. A few days later, we'll get back to taking a look at the car. Because of the muffler we ended up choosing, the exhaust is nice and quiet. In fact, it's so quiet that on fast idle, the noise from the engine bay drowns it out. Some of this is normal belt and engine noise, and it would have been dampened by that underhood liner. But we also have a pretty pervasive clickety-clack that seems to be coming from the valve train. The first obvious suspects are the lifters. If the hydraulic lifters are clogged with varnish or old oil or what have you, then sometimes they can't take up slack in the pushrod system as quickly as they should. This results in a clattering noise, and 305 Chevys are particularly notorious for it. It also wouldn't be surprising considering the age and the mileage of the car, as well as the fact that it had been sitting. To try to narrow this down, we'll check out another couple possibilities. The first of which is loud or malfunctioning TBI injectors. It was easy enough to narrow this down just by lifting the lid off the air cleaner and noting that the noise didn't change. The spray from the injectors looks good, and they seem pretty quiet. The ones on the 4.3 liter that came in the S10 Blazer were much louder. The next thing we'll do to try to narrow down where the noise is coming from is use a hose to listen to various areas. This is an old trick, and still a very useful one for narrowing down the source of a sound. A similar method uses the handle of a large screwdriver or a socket extension placed against the parts themselves to try to narrow down the source of a noise. By listening to various parts of the engine bay, we can confirm that it's not an exhaust leak and that it is coming from the valve train area. So it most likely is the lifters, but it could also be misadjusted rocker arms. If the valve train wears enough, or if the rockers are adjusted to be too loose, you'll end up with a lot of clatter from the valve cover area. The driver's side valve cover is pretty accessible, so it should be easy enough to remove it and check that out. We'll start by removing that air cleaner lid and disconnecting the intake hose. Then we'll disconnect the vacuum hose, the electrical connector, and the breather tube just as we did in a previous episode. And once the air cleaner has been removed, we'll go ahead and disconnect the PCV valve and the other vacuum hose that travels over the valve cover. Hopefully there's enough room around the valve cover to get it out without moving anything else, so we'll go ahead and remove the four bolts holding it in. And when we tried to remove it, we quickly realized it was a little optimistic, thinking we could leave this vacuum line connected. But it's no big deal, we'll loosen up the nut on this bracket and then the flare nut going into the intake manifold. This vacuum hard line is connected to a hose and used for the brake booster. If we just pull off the hose going to the brake booster check valve, we should be able to leave everything in place if we just move this line a little bit. And with that turned out of the way, we can almost get the valve cover out, but again, I guess that was too optimistic. We'll also need to move this alternator brace. We'll loosen up the nut on the bottom side and then remove the bolt holding it to the alternator. Then we can slide it forward and out of the way, and at long last, the valve cover can come off. The inside of that valve cover is looking very good. There is no appreciable sludge buildup. But of course, we have to remember that the previous owner had cylinder head work done after overheating the engine. Because of that, it would be unlikely that the rocker arms would be loose due to wear, and much more likely that if they were loose, it's because they were misadjusted. But going through and checking the push rods, it seems like everything's in order. This is probably not where our noise is coming from. We've talked about this extensively in previous engine videos, so we won't repeat too much, but basically, the method I prefer is to find a valve that's fully closed and try to lift the pushrod. There should be no looseness felt while lifting the pushrod, and you should be able to rotate it without too much force. After checking the push rods on all the closed valves, we went ahead and put a wrench on the crankshaft so that we can turn it until the other valves are closed. We checked them as well, so everything on the driver's side checks out. Of course, the only way to know for sure they're adjusted properly would be to loosen all of them and reset them, but I don't really feel like doing that right now. 
Based on what we're seeing here, I'll go ahead and assume that they're all adjusted correctly, or at the very least, they're not loose. And that leaves us with the lifters. They were the most obvious choice, and that appears to be where everything is pointing. This engine uses roller lifters, which we visually confirmed using a small camera, so the system should be pretty forgiving, and we're not going to worry about damaging the camshaft. So for now, we'll go ahead and reinstall that driver's side valve cover. It's worth noting that it has a silicone valve cover gasket, which I'm a big fan of. They're easy to clean and reusable since they don't tear apart. The presence of this kind of gasket also supports the story that the heads were worked on recently. We'll go ahead and clean both sides of the gasket as well as both mating surfaces. Then we'll drop back on the valve cover. Once it's fully in place, we'll feel around the lip and make sure the gasket is still where it should be. I pinched a valve cover gasket on the 78 Firebird once and it took a while to figure out where it was leaking oil from. Anyway, with that in place, we'll reinstall the four valve cover bolts. These use copper washers to seal, so we want to make sure the top of the valve cover is clean, as well as both sides of the washer and the bottom of the bolt head. We'll get the four bolts threaded in finger tight and make sure the valve cover is still where it should be. Then we'll go from bolt to bolt and tighten them down to 8 foot-pounds in several increments. Then we'll go back through and reinstall all the parts we had to move. First is the alternator brace. We'll apply anti-seize to the top bolt and thread it back in. Then we'll tighten back down the nut on the bottom that holds it to the exhaust manifold. And with that locked down, we'll tighten up the top bolt. Going by all the comments we've gotten over the years, some people admire our use of torque specs, while other people react to them like a torque wrench cheated on them with their roommate in college. We'll save that discussion for a different video, but you can see we didn't use the torque wrench to tighten down this alternator bolt. Sometimes, especially with softer metals, it's a good idea to just tighten those bolts down by feel. Anyway, that brace is back in place, and we'll tighten back down the vacuum hard line, as well as the nut that holds the bracket attached to it in place. We'll also be sure to reconnect the PCV valve vacuum hose as well as the other hose on the throttle body. And we'll drop back on the air cleaner assembly, reconnecting the vacuum hose, the breather hose, the intake air tube, the manifold heat riser tube, and the electrical connector. And with the lid and wing nut reinstalled, we'll make sure everything is in place and held down securely. And while we're here, we'll do a quick check of the serpentine belt. We'll put a wrench on the tensioner and retract it to make sure it's still applying enough spring pressure. That feels good, and the belt is still pliable with no visible cracking, so I think it's probably not too old. We do have a replacement belt, but we'll probably leave that one in the car and keep this one on the engine for now. Odds are, this was replaced along with the water pump when that cylinder head work was done. Now that we can say with a relatively high degree of confidence that the ticking is just from the lifters being a little bit sticky, there are a couple things we can try. Since this noise probably won't amount to any damage, the first thing we can try is just ignoring it. Yeah, I'm not so good at doing that. Another thing we could try are various products that you add to the oil, and we'll actually try those a little bit later. Things like seafoam and Marvel Mystery Oil can help clean up things like varnish and buildup in the lifters. But since the car has been sitting for a while, something else that could help is just getting the engine warm and letting the oil flow through everything. To do that, we'll just let the car sit in idle for a while. We haven't gotten the car up to operating temperature yet and it's been sitting for a couple years, so in all likelihood it hasn't been warmed up in a while. While the engine is idling and things are warming up, we'll also top off the transmission fluid. It wasn't terribly low, but because of that leaking driveshaft seal that we replaced in a previous episode, it had lost some fluid. We'll run the transmission through all the gears and check the level again, and everything seems good. The car seemed to be warming up nicely, but the ticking wasn't really going away. Another thing that might help the situation is bringing up the engine RPM. The added heat and oil pressure might just help clean out the lifters. We could just rev it in park or neutral, but sometimes you just need a good old-fashioned Italian tune-up. But I'm not quite confident enough to drive the car on the streets yet, so what can we do? Well, the car does need new tires because these are pretty dry rotted. And the driveway's about due to be resealed anyway, so... That was with applying a little bit of brake pressure and probably three quarters throttle. Because of the open diff, we're probably going to have to settle for just spinning one tire, but a burnout is still a burnout. For this next one, the transmission is in low range, and I really wanted to see if it would be able to maintain a burnout once the brakes were let off. So it starts with heavy throttle and heavy brake application, then quickly letting off the brakes. Yeah, the low-powered engine and the highway gears aren't exactly a tire-shredding combination. 
This time we'll brake boost it a little bit and step on the accelerator at the same time we let off the brake pedal. For 160 or 170 horsepower, depending on who you ask, that's not too bad. Although the dry rotted tires definitely help. In hindsight, it would have been a good idea to spray the tires down with WD-40 to get it to spin both, but this time, spinning one tire will have to do. That time we started with the hard brake application and a light throttle and then just slowly swapped the two. You might also notice that unlike that launch in the first video, there's no more backfiring on deceleration. That was probably a byproduct of all of the exhaust leaks. Just to make sure we really clean out those lifters, we should probably get the RPMs pretty high and give it one more shot. This time the transmission is in second gear, so it'll shift out of first once the RPMs get high enough. We'll just lightly hold the brake pedal and stomp the accelerator to wide open throttle. It may have only been spinning the right tire, but it seems like it did a pretty good job of it. It definitely left its mark on the asphalt. After parking the car, we noticed that the temperature gauge was suddenly reading very high. Doing burnouts will definitely raise your engine temperature, but it seemed like it climbed way faster than it should have. And five minutes later, it was reading 100 degrees again. And then it was just acting screwy. Some quick electrical troubleshooting showed us that the center was bad, so it's not likely that we actually overheated the engine. We'll have to take care of that in a future episode. Well, that was fun. I hope everybody had a good time this episode, and I think that'll about do it. The what? The reason we were doing the burnouts. Oh, the lifters. Right, right, yes. Okay, so, to my ears, before doing the burnouts, it sounded like there were four or five lifters sticking. Then after doing the burnouts, it sounded like there were only one or two. But on the camera's microphone, it doesn't sound terribly different. So it's hard to say if I actually made that up or not. Anyway, since we tried the good old fashioned method of just getting the engine warm and getting the RPMs up, we'll try an actual product. First we'll try, well it's not actually seafoam, it's the generic cheap Walmart version, but it's probably close enough. We'll measure out a cup of it and put that much in the engine oil. Treatments like this can, sometimes, help break down grime and sludge in the engine. It also thins out the oil a little bit, which could help with the lifters too. Products like this also tell you to add them to the gas tank and they might help clean out the fuel system. They can also be added straight into the intake. This can be done with a vacuum line, but for this car we're just going to drip it straight into the throttle body. Again, the claims are that products like this can help clean intake runners, valves, and pistons. Personally, I think products like these might be able to help in certain situations, but I wouldn't spend a lot of money on them just hoping that they might help. After running the engine for a while and dumping the rest of the knockoff seafoam into the intake, there hadn't been a significant change in noise. These products recommend that you drive the car for a while and run it through a couple heat cycles. Since we're not actually doing that, we can't say that the product isn't working, but we really can't say that it is either. Now we're jumping ahead to around two weeks later, and the noise still hasn't improved. The engine is still running at fast idle here, so it's not as pronounced, but the lifters are still clicky clacking away. Other than driving the car up and down the street, it still really hasn't been driven, but it's been warmed up a couple of times. What we've decided to do is drain out the oil and try another product. So we'll undo the plug and fill up that drain pan. The oil is a bit dark, but the other times I've used seafoam and crankcases, it has turned the oil completely black. So maybe the half price Walmart stuff isn't as good, or maybe it just needed more time to work. Either way, we'll reinstall the drain plug and torque it back down. And yes, we were able to do this without lifting the car, but it's a tight fit and I wouldn't recommend it. In the name of being oh so incredibly cheap, what we decided to do is use a quart of Marvel Mystery Oil and add that to the oil that we drained. 
Marvel Mystery Oil is also very cheap, and I've had some pretty good luck with it in the past. All we're doing is replacing a quart of the oil that we drained out with a quart of mystery oil. This stuff will also thin out the oil a bit, as well as helping clean out some of the gunk in the engine. On camera, that oil does look pretty black, but it's not leaving a dark film on the funnel or anything like real dirty oil would. If it was anything but a high mileage, almost three decade old small block Chevy engine, I would probably spend 10 extra bucks and just put in new oil. But this oil has maybe three hours of runtime and two miles traveled on it, so we're just gonna go ahead and reuse it for a little while. So we'll undo the oil cap and pour in our five quarts of mixed oil. Then we'll start the car back up, rev it a little bit, and run it for a little while. Again, my ears told a bit of a different story than the camera microphone seems to, but to me, it sounded much better. And after just running it a few times, it seemed like the lifter noise was down significantly. And after a little bit of driving, sometimes the noise is completely gone. It still comes and goes sometimes, so hopefully just a couple oil and filter changes will take care of that. And for the time being, we're calling it fixed, or at least as closest we're going to get. I guess in the end, we kinda ended up going with option one anyway, where we're just gonna ignore it. And in the spirit of ignoring it, let's talk about something else. We did get new tires. And in order to get them mounted, we'll go ahead and remove the old ones. We'll start by once again, lifting up the car and setting it on jack stands. And unlike last time where we tried to take the wheels off and weren't able to, this time we have the security lug nut socket. So we'll spin off the four regular lug nuts and then get the security socket on there and remove that one as well. I will say that the impact gun and the security lug nuts didn't really get along. After installing and removing the wheels a few times, the lug nuts were a little bit deformed. We went ahead and got four more regular lug nuts and we'll just replace the security ones with those. But that's something we'll take care of later. The new tires were a little bit smaller than the old ones, but still wider than factory. They're 225-60-15s and were mostly chosen because they seemed like the cheapest option. We threw the new tires in the truck with the old wheels and took them to a local shop to get them mounted and balanced. Surprisingly, the cheap tires balanced out really well and barely required any weights at all. And there you have it, we have four new tires ready to go back on the car. You might think this episode would end with us reinstalling them, but that actually didn't happen for a little while. We'll leave the car up on jack stands, because in the next episode we're going to start working on the brakes. So for this episode, I think that means we'll call it a day. And in hindsight, what exactly did we accomplish this time? Well, we put new tires on the wheels, and we did some cool burnouts? You know, I think that's good enough. I can live with that.